qualified to deliver the opening keynote address for our event, and I think it would be a great learning experience for us. Just a quick point though, uh, Pierre is uh, uh, very engaging, but uh, humorous and sometimes stab you in the back kind of guy. So last year I was at the, uh, we had a mood conference, and after I had done my keynote for the MOOC conference, Pierre, who did the second keynote, came up and said, that's a nice theory, George, but everything is wrong. And, uh, and then things went downhill from there. But uh, anyway, it's a huge pleasure. If you, if you want to learn more about uh, Pierre, just do a quick uh, scholar search for him, and you'll see the enormous impact he's had on the field. And I think you why it is that we, we were eager to have him do our opening keynote. Pierre. myself. I'm a professor in the School of Computer Science, but I'm originally an elementary school teacher. And I'm very proud of that. I'm the only one at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Lausanne. I'm the only school teacher. But I was a teacher uh, 30 years ago in Brussels, actually. Uh, I'm from this country that will beat USA tomorrow at the World Cup. But now I work in another country, Switzerland, that will beat Argentina also tomorrow uh, at the World Cup. So uh, in the title in the, in the conference uh, program, I'm supposed to talk about eye tracking. I will talk about eye tracking, but also about gadgets. I'm in a lab where we do, we do a lot of gadgets. Chile is the name of the lab, Computer Human Interaction for Learning and Instruction, as, as you could guess. And um, so eye tracking, MOOCs, gadgets, that's the topic of the day. And I try to unify this thing with some kind of graph theory that we present. So the first idea we had, um, I don't know, seven years ago, what? Because we were studying collaborative learning. What if we connect two eye trackers? So two people work online. They look at the same display with two eye trackers. Can we predict the quality of collaboration by the fact that people tend to look at the same thing at the same time? And the answer is yes. I will not give all the talk like that, but we did try with six or seven different tasks. Yes, let's imagine you do an Excel, you do a budget for the conference with a colleague online, and you look at the Excel spreadsheet, and you say, this is too much. But you look at B10, and you look at C5. Then you will misunderstand, of course. So the, ten, the tendency to look at the same thing at the same time predicts the quality of collaboration, predicts the, the frequency of misunderstanding. But we never look exactly at the same thing and never exactly at the same time. So here is this a graph of the gaze on some object of the screen. Let's imagine we look at the same screen and there is a banana. Okay? At some point, the speaker, Mr. Blue, will say banana. This is time zero. So more than 700 milliseconds before to say banana, he will look at it in 68% of the case. And the listener, this is Mr. Red, will look at it more or less 1.2 seconds later. So there is a time lag that other people confirm of about two seconds before. I look at the computer, I say computer, you look at the computer. So when we say at the same time, it's more or less two seconds. So, I don't go through all the studies, but I just show, show you the last one. This is two guys doing P programming, programming together, editing, uh, well, trying to understand the same piece of Scala code. And we did a manual analysis of the quality of the collaboration using a coding scheme by Anna Meyer and Spada, listening the video and saying, this is a good pair, this is a bad pair. Okay? And here is a typical. Uh, bad pair, and you will see the, the non-convergence of their gates. Uh, this bar check for so Mr. Blue and Mr. Uh, Red. It, actually, uh, P, uh, first look, P is for player, and those uh, uh, indexes so that's right. uh, are for their, their uh, list of papers. And they talk about something, but they look at different things. In comparison, here, what you see here in this, maybe you don't see, this is the co-occurrence matrix where the diagonal is when they look at the same thing at the same time. Let's compare with a good pair. What, what is this, this, this line for? I don't know. Well, it's a different. Like, like it's, we oh, we, we, we just look at the two times. 
The four eyes actually are dancing together. The guys are together. They are completely aligned. If we do that with more pairs, we see the, this result. This part here it is. So I don't know if you can see. There is no difference between the medium and the good pairs, but the bad pairs who collaborate badly um, are a much lower gaze request. So they tend not to look at the same thing. OK, makes sense. Now, what, how does it apply to MOOCs? I must say that our university has been totally into the MOOCs game. So this is, uh, I'm also in charge of that. In, um, can the camera make sure that when I move here, you project also my image there so that I can point to the three Slides at the same time? <laughs> oh, this one. Okay. So we got 600,000 registration in a bit more than one year. Okay? Bullshit. Uh, we know these registration numbers are bullshit, but uh, still, they, they mean that's not nothing. You know, one third never come, one third just pick a few videos, one third really participate, and so on and so on. But of course, it's a great opportunity for us to do analytics. And here's a nice experiment. On our videos, we have this, I don't know if you can say, this semi-transparent hand. On the normal screen, it's, it's more visible. So the teacher is speaking. We record this hand from the top, and we make it semi-transparent so you can still read through the hand. Is that useful? At the same time, he is writing, so we see the writing. So why should we have these pointing gestures? And to analyze this, we use eye tracking again. And here is a video where you will see uh, the extent to which the gaze of the learner follow the pointing of the teacher. First, we look at one student, and here the, the teacher uses a pen. Should put some sound. Uh, so you would write x colon double y colon int. You can also give the return type of a function that for. You've seen in the last slide that function parameters come with their type after the parameter name and a colon in Scala. So you would write x colon double y colon int. You can also give the return type of a function that for... And finally, for 40 students? You've seen in the last slide that function parameters come with their type. And this type is given after the parameter name and a colon in Scala. So you would write x colon double y colon int. You can also give the return type of a function that follows after the parameters. So is that the useful? The primitive types are written as in Java, but they are capitalized. So int, for example, is a 32-bit integer. Double is a 64-bit floating-point number. And Boolean represents the Boolean type with values true and false. So when the teacher is pointing, not all learners, but some of them, Part of the gaze converge on the deity gesture of the teacher.
this? This is the place where the trucks will leave and arrive. So augmented reality, you get feedback because the shelves are too close over there. Here, it displays feedback, different feature of the lesson, how to increase storage of phase. Students and my students need a reflex. Huh? It's not because they are apprentices. So, how could we help the teacher to manage it? You are a teacher. We give cool technologies to the students in the class. You kill the teacher. He has an enemy in the class. Somebody who is much more attractive than the teacher, like your laptop, for instance. You know? So, we, how can we help the teacher to manage this classroom? So, here it is in my pocket. We gave them orchestration cards. These are this kind of cards. They cannot run the simulation. This is a card show. You cannot run the simulation. Okay? So the teacher shows the cards. The kids cannot run the simulation. They build the warehouse, and then they have to call the teacher. The teacher is walking in the class like that, with a paper in his back, and says, sir, sir, I we want to run the simulation. OK? Do you think the warehouse will be faster than the previous one? Ooh. OK, it's so like you kids. You don't know. I'll ah, think about it, and you call me when you know. Okay. Sir, sir, yes, yes. Yes, we think it will, it will be faster. Yeah, it will be faster. Why? <laughs> you don't know. OK, think about it. And when the teacher comes back, he showed you the cards, side of the card, and he ran the simulation. And this is my favorite one. Pause the class. He show one card to one lamp, and all the lamps become white, and he can speak for one minute. Otherwise, it would take five minutes. Guys, please, 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 can I have you, please, can I have you at, it would take maybe three minutes, but three minutes twice in the lesson, that makes six minutes, that is 10% of the lesson time. So we had to invent this orchestration part. And when I talk about orchestration, I can talk about these things. It's not a learning theory. It's how do you manage this bloody class with this bloody technology from a very practical aspect. Time management, discipline, grades, uh, safety, uh, physicality, and so on. That's something new. In the past, in learning science, it would be called implementation details. <laughs> I think that this should be part of the design of the theory itself. So look at this one, for instance. The teacher set up the activities by putting just a sheet of paper on the table. There is no login. I'm a member of the party against login in school. Because when you are a teacher, if you ask the kids to log in, you waste five minutes again. And it is useless. So um, this sheet of paper, he has a binder with all the lessons. He opened the binder, he put a sheet of paper on the table, he can take notes on it, and it works very well. So orchestration, I stop here about orchestration, is the idea of 
It's not that all people learn. So how can you as a teacher manage this? OK, so now I come to with a graph story. Okay. So here is a basic, simple definition. We talk about integrated learning. I am not behaviorist. I am not social constructivist. I, I'm behaviorist at 9 o'clock, social constructivist at 9.15, and then I am PHS at 9.25. I don't care. I don't belong to any uh, educational church. Integrated learning means you can integrate in your lesson whatever activity. Some of them are individual activities, first play. Some of them are team activities. I'm from CSCL, but it's cool to have individual learning. Not everything has to be collaborative. And then you have lectures, like this one, or debriefing lectures when they're done. So very simple, a graph integrates sequence of activities on different planes. OK, let me show you one example of a very old graph that I implemented in 98. First, we start with a, some of you were not born, I know. So uh, we start by individual activities. I ask all members in the class to answer a questionnaire. Online, there is no right or wrong answer. The different answers reflect different opinions. Then, for each of these answers, I have anticipated the x, y value so that I can plot them on a graph. And this graph will reflect the opinions. Okay? When you show to a class a graph of themselves, I mean, this is for you in Leuven, when students see the name, they react. They are with you. They get involved. They say, hey, Andreas, look where you are. I knew you were an extreme right person and so on. <laughs> so it creates a participation in the class. And then, you know, social co co constructivism, uh, Dwight and Muni, people learn because they disagree, and to solve this disagreement, they will have to change their viewpoint. So what we take is say, okay, Ben and Andreas, you have opposite opinion, so now you will solve the same questionnaire again. Okay? If you increase a disagreement, you will actually increase learning. And then, once they've all answered to this questionnaire, there is a debriefing tool where the teacher sees all the answers. And basically, they have not learned yet. They have argued a lot. And the role of the teacher, based on this debriefing activity, is to organize what they learn, to give labels and so on. So, and then there is a day to write a summary. So, this is uh, a simple thing, OK? A graph is a sequence of activity. But it allows you to make kind of sophisticated learning approach, like this Arby graph. Or do you engineer conflict in your classroom? You want to maximize conflict in your No, not to maximize. To optimize. My English is so bad. To optimize, me know. To optimize a conflict among your, st your students. And instead of leaving free conflict, you try to engineer the situation, this is called a script. You try to engineer the pedagogical scenario by playing with individual team and class activity in such a way that this conflict will rise, rise, and that, that you will be able later on as a teacher to use it. So these graphs can model more complex scripts. This is a very well-known script called Jigsaw. You have teamwork, but in every team there are four different roles. And at some point, you split this team, you change the teams, all the people who play the role A4, they meet for a while, and then you loop and you start this again. Okay. So it's a simple uh, la visual language described kind of rich pedagogical scenario. And there are three more layers. The periphery, there are people with a stable relationship with the school, with the class, a login. Uh, the community, like the museum people that meet, and the world. Okay, so we can describe a lot of pedagogical approach by these six levels. We could change the levels, but it works quite well, I must say. So the edges are uh, the vertices activities, and the edges are what is the relationship between two learning activities. And here in learning science, we have a full dictionary. Okay? That's my own classification, but uh, a very old one that I like, advanced organizer. We have an activity before that will kind of pre-activate some cognitive structure in the mind of the kids for the next activity. Uh, motivation, of course, we do an activity to explain what will be the goal of the learning. Uh, transfer is key to education. Uh, alternate, you have done one activity with some visual representation, and then you do the same activity with a different visual representation. Also very well known to be connected. So these graphs, they look a bit like Semantic less, but no, there, there, there is the semantics. We have a lot of, uh, this is not a proper uh, 
contribution to learning science to classify them like that. It's just my own classification. But we have a very rich library of relationship between activities. Now, this is the advertisement booth. This is a picture I've taken from the uh, window of my office. <laughs> and uh, uh, I just want to say that at Lausanne, usually in the morning, we have great ski. In the afternoon, we go sailing. In the evening, uh, we have great wine. And I have an open postdoc position. <laughs> <laughs> so, now I continue to graph stuff. You have seen that here, between activity one and two, I had to automatically compute the individual answers to build a map. So you need an operator to do that. You need a bit of a problem that will automatically build a map. You have seen that at step two, once I had the map, I had automatically to compute the most people far away from each other and to automatically send them the information that no, they have to do the argumentation together. You have seen that at the end of the argumentation, the tool has to collect all the answers to build the debriefing picture for the professor. So this is not only a pedagogical idea, this graph. It is a workflow. Between activities, you collect data, you process data that feed to the next activity. And then you collect data that will feed the next activity. And this data will feed the next activity. So this, these things work because there is a, a workflow behind. I've tried the same workflow with paper. It works as well. But with paper, it does not scale up very well. I've done exactly the same scenario with piece of paper that worked well up to 20 people. But the question today about MOOCs is, would this graph work with 20,000 people? And this is why we have to make these operators explicit. And again, this is not semantic-less. We have a very rich library of operators that we need to run this, um, like, building a visualization of the student's answer. This is one operator. Uh, making automatically group with opposite opinion or with similar opinion. That's another operator. Uh, and so on and so on. So the reason why I mention this is the following one. This is my view of MOOCs. Or no, in learning science, in physical classroom, we've been quite good at developing very rich learning activities. They are here. But once we have to scale up, we tend to have less rich learning activities. We tend to reduce the richness. We pay the price for scale. We say, well, it's not as cool as a classroom, but at least everybody can have access. And this is my question. And this is my hope behind this graph with operators. Maybe we can take some of these very rich activities and formalize them with a graph, with operators, and then we will be able to scale them. It's an hypothesis, a dream, whatever. I have not done it. But remember, we ski in the morning, we, ski, we sail in the afternoon. So if you want to do it, you are welcome in the sun. And um, so if I summarize, a graph is a set of vertices and edges. The vertices are the activities. And we've seen some of these properties. The edges are associated to operators and to a weight. So two activities are connected to a way to a, by a edge, which can be more or less heavy. If one activity is really important for the next one, we should capture that in the graph. It should be a, a very heavy edges between these two activities. If two activities are kind of randomly put next to each other, this edge should be very light. So uh, how can you compute that? So let's call x the state of the learner at, at the end of activity i of the learner S, of the student S. So we have the state after each activity. And uh, so all of you have already recognized uh, the, the clear matching with the Markov model over there. And if we have this timestamps, so this timestamp state of the learner after each activity, let's imagine that very simple case. We have four states. The student can be lost. It can be more, active, more or less active, but not well understanding. It can be very with me, completely understanding, or it can be out, okay, drop out. And so we can model the transition between these four states by adding uh, transition matrices. But before that, let me just mention what is a state. This is a very naive example of states. 
But again, in learning science, we have a, lit we have a lot of literature that describes the richness of cognitive states. Not only fail, for instance, I like this one, impasse. I don't know if you know the theory of Kurt Van Leyen. Uh, impasse is at some point you are stuck with what you know, and the system shows you that you are stuck, and it's a very good state because then they are ready to learn, like, like you, have, you have learned physics, but there was no Coriolis content, and so we can ask you to compute the trajectory of something on 200 kilometers, and without Coriolis, you will be wrong. So we give you a problem that makes you stuck, and uh, overgeneralization, undergeneralization, deep and surface learning, there is a lot of conflictual literature on that. Group seeing, when a group converges too early on some agreement, just because they want to agree, but this is superficial. So we have a rich literature of states, actually. It's not just my naive example of lost activity. Now, if we keep learning analytics with this kind of naive example, we will not go further. We have to feed analytics with, with a much uh, richer, light, um, let's say, pedagogically meaningful set of states. So now we have this transition matrix, OK? The guys move from uh, one state to another state. And I want to measure the strength of these edges. So look at this matrix. Uh, I don't know where I should stay. OK. This is a matrix where everybody stays in the same state. So it's very predictive. The entropy is very low. Then I normalize the entropy by the number of states. So very predictive matrix. This one is the same, but very nice. Everybody succeeds well. Okay. Very, uh, so this is a maximum entropy. Uh, you have no clue, knowing the previous state, you have no clue what will be the next state. Okay? And this one is a more, kind of more realistic matrix. So we can compute the weight of an edge, the strength between two activities, as 1 minus the entropy of this transition matrix. That's not enough. Because if we do that, this one will be the same as this one. And from the pedagogical point of view, it's not the same. This is a useless teacher or a useless activity. Nobody improves. This is the best teacher in the world. Everybody is fine at the end. So we want to measure these things. And I came with another value called the utopy. I know it doesn't exist in English, this word, but I, I like to do to, to, to the same hand as entropy, entropy, utopy. That's it. Was the idea. So uh, here it is. You have a very positive. Utopy is, let's say, the green is better than red. So the people who improve the state is uh, are more than the probability to improve the state is higher than the probability to, to, to decrease the state. It means that you have a square matrix. It means that the state are ordered from the lowest to the best one. And of course, this one improved by one level. The next diagonal improved by two steps, the two states. The last, the next one by three states. So you weight the difference between this and this by the distance of the diagonal, and you get to another value, which is I call the utopy. I don't know if this is a good idea. But uh, it gives you, is that, you know, it's useless to be very predictive if you know that everybody will fail. Well, it's useful to publish in luck, but it's not very useful in life. You better be positive, uh, certain about that, the fact that everybody will succeed. Of course, these strengths will not last forever. If you motivate the students and come back two weeks later, that's over. So, so there is this notion of elasticity. All the strengths that we just computed will decrease over time. Some, and this elasticity will be important to, so, to for orchestration. How can you easily modify these graphs when you are a teacher, like with a paper cut? So these are the states of the learner. But of course, we have not only the history of state, we have also the behavior evidence. So all of you recognize this idea of, of Markov models there. And so how do we go from the behavior to the state? This is the diagnosis process. And again, this diagnosis has an entropy. Let's imagine at time zero here, this is my four states. Maximal entropy, I don't know. The learner is in any of the four states. And so the entropy is there. And then at the next step, there are different levels of behavior, different types of behavior. If you say, for instance, is that clear for everybody? And the students, no. No decrease of entropy. You know, it means nothing. It's not behavioral information. If one student says, sir, 
I think there is a mistake on your slide. Then the entropy for this guy falls on because this guy is completely busy. So the entropy of the diagnosis is how much you uncertainty on the diagnosis is decreased by the behavior of the learner. So we have two dimensions. We have the, tra the transition, the horizontal dimension, and we have this behavioral diagnosis entropy. I know that in Markov they represent it like that, but if, please allow me to represent it like that because then I can introduce a third dimension. And this is the, um, the final stuff. If you know, if you want to predict, if you want to compute the state of John at this moment, you have three sources of information. You have the state of John at the previous activity. That's what I showed before with the transition matrix. You have the behavior of John, what I showed with the uh, diagnosis entropy. And finally, you have the state of Suzanne. If the state of John was the same as the state of Suzanne before, then it might be the same. If you have no clue there, no clue there, you might use this one. If everybody fails, if every uh, sorry, if everybody fails this activity and you have no clue about John, there is a probability the probability that he fails is higher than he succeeds. So you have three, three sources of information that they have to be combined. And a nice, I call that a cube. It's not a cube from a mathematical point of view. I'm not a mathematician, as you probably have noticed. I, I just call it a, a cube because uh, it's, let's say, a three-dimensional stuff. But you can reason. If the state of John was better than the state of Suzanne at the time minus one, it may be the same. No. If the behavior of John, let's say the eye-tracking eye pattern of John led to this state, and if he has the same eye-tracking pattern, you might infer these states. So you can play with the different uh, reasoning of this cube. Uh, if his behavior, or let's say his gaze, uh, focus on the, on the right elements increased by 10%, maybe his state has also increased by 10%. So the nice thing of having a three-dimensional model um, is that we could have this three-dimensional reasoning. It's a theory. I have not done it. We ski in the morning, we sail in the afternoon, we <laughs> have So, and uh, uh, the last few slides, why am I with time? Uh, a few slides. So the, the main point here was um, analytics is not something we do after the MOOC or after the lesson. We should try to integrate the analytics from the design of the technology. And that's the idea of this graph. Now, I just applied that to classroom, a few slides. And uh, let me show, hello? Yeah. Let me show you uh, now a face-to-face -face situation. This is a class of EPFL, Physics 101. Uh, we take 2% of the best three students, and half of them will fail in the first year, namely because of Physics 101. You know, they have two hours lecture and then two hours exercise. In the exercise, they receive a sheet of paper, and then when they are stuck, they call a teaching assistant. And after a few minutes, look at what's happening. This is the real video. The teaching assistant is the, the, the lady on, in the back here. And I want you to look at this guy <coughs> here. Physics 101, the toughest class at EPFL. And look, this guy, oh, we don't see him. This guy continues to walk. He's, he's also calling this, but he does not. Oh, because he wants to grab a teaching assistant when she's available. So, I like this. Uh, this example. I like problems. I never try to innovate. I don't know what it means. I like to, uh, problems. But here, so we have this problem of this really ineffective orchestration. So Hamed invented this, this thing here uh, called the lantern. And the kids enter the class and put that on the desk. One, exercise one, exercise two, three, four. Why? Because if I'm on five and everybody is on one, I can wait a little bit. I will get my Nobel Prize later on. Okay? Then the number of LEDs grow with time. Why? Because if I'm here and I ask for help, I will never become an engineer. I first have to try by myself. So that's it. So uh, you, you put that on your desk, and when you need help, you push on it, and you start blinking. Okay. And slowly, at the beginning, and faster and faster. This is not. 
this is a stupid piece of technology. <laughs> it's, not, it's not smart. I'm from Belgium. So this is not smart. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I'm from the right part of Belgium. Uh, uh, oh. No, no, to, we, we will win together, so we will love each other. So, um, so this is not smart. Wasted time, 62 person, what we observe in the class, with this uh, six person. We just put that in the kids, simply they push on it, and uh, um, they, they continue to work. Okay, simple technology, but that's uh, uh, a big effect. Six person, some wasted time. So, what are the analytics? Well, these things talk to each other, and you actually collect data from the class for which exercise, how much time they've been working on the exercise, how much time they've been with the TA, and how much time they've been. Well, very simple visualization for the teacher, but that gives them data also from the. Uh, so you will tell me now you have to put a sensor, EE sensor, EEG sensor, things, all kinds of sensor of the kids. Well, this is kind of poetic. You put that in the in the room, it's blinking and so. But that was before. That was my when I was young, and we were making gadgets. Now we became more serious. And Milko, who presented uh, this morning, uh, is trying to make something in the same vein, but not anymore with uh, gadgets. It's a bit sad, but uh, he, you know, he wants to be a computer scientist. So if we are trying to put, um, we, he is putting uh, cameras that try to do, not eye tracking with 40 people, because that's not exactly eye tracking, but to measure the attention of the learner, the direction of their face, and how they co-move. If they move together, basically it's because they follow from city. And this something is a teacher. And so at the same time, we gave to the teachers, including me, some eye tracking device so that we can also see all the gaze of the teacher, and I've been doing that for the last uh, 30 minutes now. All the gaze of the teacher is influencing uh, the attention of the participants by scanning systematically the enemy in front of me. <laughs> so, so the last point is that this analytics is not only for the uh, online stuff, but also for the face-to-face -face classes. And I want to conclude with that. Uh, I mean, what matters in schools is love, is life, is fun, is social relationship. I'm not talking about that. I'm not saying that this is not the most important thing. Okay? What I'm, I, I've been a school teacher, as I mentioned, research, 31 kids, and they phoned me and they organized a party 25 years later in the same class. We had a very strong relationship. That's the most important thing. Okay? But what we can model is the formal aspect. And my claim is that if you take a MOOC or if you take a lesson on the square for nine years old kids, it's the same structure, it's the same formal graph, it's the same. And if we could help teachers by, by actually bringing Markov or whatever into the teaching, teaching training college, I would like to help teachers to think formally about the way they're teaching. It's like chess playing, you know. Teaching a concept, you play with positive negative example. If there is overgeneralization, you introduce negative example. If there is undergeneralization, you introduce positive example. It's a very form of state, uh, yeah, graph of state that you can navigate to. So it's not that I want to say, and these are pictures from, from other things we do where there is a lot of life, but uh, so this formalization of education doesn't mean that social relationships are not the most important, but we should formalize a bit more what can be formalized. Thank you very much. So we've got uh, about 15 minutes, I believe it is, for questions. So any comments or reactions to, uh, and we've got microphones here, so raise your hand if you'd like to follow up with any comments or perspectives. Got Chris over here. Thank you, uh, Pierre. Chris from the University of Michigan. Um, I, I really enjoyed uh, um, many of the aspects of the things you were sharing. And I wanted to ask you a question about the uh, 
authentic learning environment and the student population of MOOCs, we know this population is incredibly diverse and how do we do interesting things like eye tracking yet still um, uh, make sure that we're going to the population that's taking the MOOCs, uh, the people sitting on the bus using their tablet, the people with the phone in their pocket who are listening and, and still, still uh, involve them in the analysis um, that we're doing. Um, so you are right. Two thirds of the people who take a MOOC say a bachelor or a master. So far, we failed to reach a promise that we will that everybody will have access to education uh, thanks to MOOC. So there is a real uh, concern over there. How can we reach and, for instance, this thing for logistic assistance? Okay, uh, we have a little problem with this lamp. It's a really nice Swiss design. It costs five thousand dollars. <laughs> So it doesn't scale up. You know, we sell to the Swiss school, the German and the French school say, I told us I'm crazy. So we have, what we've done now is an online version where you will buy um, plastic shells and uh, a box of $20, $20, and then you use a webcam and you do the thing. And uh, you, you look at the result on your screen instead of having this cool augmented reality. So, we might lose 5% of the cognitive benefits of the tangible augmentation, but we spare 99% of the cost. So we did actually one study with, uh, we have a similar approach for Carpenter, for training Carpenter, this tangible, and there we compare with eye tracking the, the physical versus the mouse based interaction, the, let's say the augmented reality versus the um, display, computer display, they don't seem to lose too much. So first we can extend MOOCs to hand workers, not only to intellectuals, it's not only mathematics, and that's one of our big projects. Training carpenters in India, in Africa, and in, in USA, and making them better. And um, the second point about eye tracking, it will, it will be there soon. Now we have already some eye tracking software for your laptop that you can it's a question of accuracy. You know in which area, more or less, the person is looking. So everybody could have eye tracking on his, on his laptop with low accuracy. But then you have to design the MOOC by knowing that the eye tracking will be so that in this area there will be this information, so you will be able to interpret your analytics. But I guess sooner you will have no, an eye tracker will be like a touchpad. It's just a part of the of the interface. So. Uh, there is already the case for one of the Samsung uh, uh, small tablet, I think, that they have embedded eye tracking. So I guess um, if we want to scale, basically what we like to do is to have a big um, analytics with 20,000 students and then a small analytics with 20 eye tracking students and we try to combine these two one, the large scale and the small scale. But sooner or later we'll be able to do large scale and advertisement will be the first market for that. There is another question there. Thank you. I'm Borhan from University of Memphis. Very interesting work. Just wanted to uh, like comment on your idea for uh, data collection in classroom, the point of view, and where they're looking at. We are uh, doing similar uh, data collection in classroom to analyze discourse and. Uh, um, I believe that uh, we're using Kinect, the new versions of uh, Microsoft Kinect, and they have the ability to uh, identify points of that their uh, points of view for multiple persons. And I was wondering if you, you're using similar technology, or if you have your own ideas for that, or maybe we can talk later after. Yeah, you can certainly talk to Mirko, who is there and he's doing this work. Uh, I don't know how many you can capture, how many people you can capture with. Uh, with uh, Kinect? Uh, about uh, we have 20, we are, we, are, we are looking at the order of 20s uh, in classroom. So. So, it, so we use cameras instead. It's not only the, eye, the gaze direction, it's also the, the body the gestures. And all these things propagate. Sometimes we have um, kind of wave of distraction. One guy gets distracted and he starts to play with his, a game on his laptop and then the people around him get distracted and you have these waves of of distraction that we try to no, because we will not manage. That we try to to um, to to capture. Uh, the point is the following one. I have seen in lectures where 
the professor starts the lecture and he has a class with him. Okay? After five minutes, he loses two last rows. Okay? And then he loses the next rows. And at the end of the lesson, the professor has only one row of students with him. You know, the first row. You know that they are like this. They are the good ones. And this guy is doing nothing. He's losing the class. He's not doing. A good teacher has the same thing. Sometimes he loses students. And he say, by the way, this will be a question for the exam. And oh, he got all the students back with him. Or he make a joke, or he fall down, or something like that. So the difference between a good orchestrator and a bad orchestrator is not that they never lose attention. It's that they notice it, and they react. So I wanted to have, you know, if you lose attention, you fall and vibrate in your pocket, or something like that. That you have this kind of prosthesis for teachers. Many teachers don't need such a tool, but some teachers do. Carlos Monroy from Rice University. Um, I see, because of your background as a, as a teacher, um, and I like when you make this comment on uh, using learning analytics to enrich pedagogical process, or uh, to add some pedagogical meaning on using learning analytics. How do you see this? What is the reception in your experience with teachers, especially in K-12 um, education, of elementary education, teachers receptive of using these technologies for uh, improving their teaching practices and how this can be used for improving their pedagogical processes. And one final thing is, I've been dreaming of a window like the one that you show there, because I don't have a window in my office, so maybe we can talk afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, I'll send you a picture. Um, so first of all, I never present that to teacher. Actually, I never presented this. This was the first time. Well, I mentioned it last week, but it was the first time I presented this graph. Today, I was a bit nervous whether analytics people would uh, kill me or not. So I don't present this graph to teacher. How, no, how do we make sure that teachers use the technology we developed? Honestly, we failed. For the last 30 years, learning technologies have been poorly used in schools. Why? We do experiments. And in this experiment, we waive some of the constraints. Uh, we say to the teacher, well, uh, can we take two hours? Usually, it's only 30 minutes. Can we take two hours? And do you mind if I close the curtains? And uh, Which the teacher will never do. And we do these kind of things. We run the experiment with the ANOVA, process pretest, great, learning poses significant difference. We publish a paper, and then we leave. Okay? And, uh, and then we say, oh, teachers do not use the technology because they have resistance, they don't, want, they don't like technology. It's not true. All teachers, they cannot book a, a flight. They cannot save the holiday picture. They use technology for the day. But in the classroom, we design technology that spoils their life, that makes their life more difficult. You see many of these tabletop research on tabletops in the classroom, and you see the room is dark. Have you been a teacher? Bring your kids to a dark room. You know? That will be you know, Christmas. You know, it's, it's fantastic. So we complain. <laughs> that they do not use our great technology because they have not been properly trained. I think it was a mistake. We should design technology that do not spoil their life. That's the story of these uh, paper cards. You know, the teacher needs to be in control. He's the boss. He has to manage his bloody class. So if we make a technology that makes it more difficult to control the class, he will, he is just smart. He does not reject the technology because he's against technology but because he noticed that we spoil his life. So trying to uh, bring things, and the way we do that is we design with teachers. We never thought about that. This came because we worked with teachers for three years, and at some point, we needed something like that. So, um, so my answer is we should design technology not only based on learning science, but based on the, very, the logistics of everyday classes, all the practical problems. That's my answer. So I, lo I love the idea of um, embedding the you know collaboration scripts, automated, whether it's jigsaw, whether it's moving from individual, small group, big group, bubbling ideas up, going down. I think this is exactly what we need to be doing in MOOCs, uh, and there's a massive potential. I'm wondering about the practicality of, you know, on the one hand, working with, with edX or Coursera, which are kind of these 
you know, somewhat closed uh, platforms in terms of functionality. I know, I, I remember two years ago, Coursera talked about apps and letting people do that more easily. I don't see it coming. So I wonder if you know, you know, do you want to try to push them to work with them to develop things? Do you want to take, let's say, edX as an open source platform and host it yourself and, and, and develop things? Or how do you think we can move forward so that it, when we're doing MOOC research, we're not just analyzing the data from courses, but we're actually consciously designing you know, uh, experimental environments? So one, one answer would be that this. If, if the ideas sounds useful to them, that they could steal some ideas of some of these ideas and integrate them. That would be a nice thing, so I don't have to implement it myself. Uh, it's true that edX is a bit more open than Coursera, because the promise is openness, but it, it will probably come with the next release in Christmas. Uh, edX has this notion of blog that you can open. I also think there will be service, online services. So you could say, there could be a service running in Lausanne. Make teams for me. I send you a list of 20,000 students with 10 features, and I send you back a list of teams of three. And this service that will cost one cent for 10 students or something like that um, would be external to the platform and not maybe, so we could have a, there is already the online proctoring service. There are some translation services, subtitling service. So I think that some of the, the MOOC ecosystem might not be everything is in Indix or everything is in Coursera, but there are a lot of uh, added value service around in the world that you can I, I like very much um, how this scales um, because it ends up basically trying to replicate the kind of face-to-face -face experience between an excellent teacher, a master teacher, and their students. Because as you mentioned, the master teacher is able to identify on the basis of a body posture whether they have the attention of the students or not. So. And so far as it scales, I think that's that's excellent. Um, my concern, however, is when you take these technologies and you bring them back to the classroom, right? So the master teacher is always going to be the master teacher, but I wonder if these technologies can be used to actually, whether you're suggesting that they be used to uh, teach teachers, to train teachers, to uh, become attuned themselves to attention, inattention, um, to orchestrating their classrooms in these particular ways. And so, so in that, to that extent, it would be sort of a, like a ladder for teachers. Um, or if you're actually suggesting that this become just like, as in the scaled environment, uh, this become kind of a crutch, uh, a replacement for the master teacher in such ways to make the master teacher no longer important. So to answer the first one, I don't think that the one-to-one -one scale is the optimal scale. That's a bit the, kind of the implicit uh, um, assumption in education is that if you manage to make, there was a famous paper from Bloom, when you manage to, uh, the Two Sigma paper, when you manage to imitate at a scale of 30 the same relationship as a scale of one to one, um, that would be the optimal case. But there are many aspects where a scale of 10 to one is better than one to one. You have the diversity of the collaborative learning uh, and, and so on. Um, so I think um, the goal is to have the cognitive intensity of the small scale activities being reached at, at, the, at, the, at the large scale. And therefore, um, I'm not sure we have to do, I have nothing against teacher training. If I was Minister of Education, I would put more money in teacher training than in learning analytics, honestly. Uh, but, um, but still, it's a bit uh, easy to say we need to improve teacher training. I think one of the key study I would like to do is to measure the cognitive load of a teacher. I've been fighting all my life against the cognitive load theory because it's an anti-constructivist theory in education. But the cognitive load of the teacher, that would be very interesting. So if we make technologies that increase the cognitive load of the teacher, we make his teaching more difficult. Being constructivist, you need to be very, very strong as a teacher. You have to manage things which are not completely driven, uh, scripted, and so on. So if we could have technologies that reduce the cognitive load of a teacher. So for instance, the teacher I mentioned, we do not notice that they lose their attention. All the cognitive load is on the content. Okay, they teach very complex content. And they have no working memory space left for classroom management. So can we offload a bit of this classroom management by having some 
prosthesis that do part of the classroom of the orchestration project. So um, we could improve teacher training. We, we can also improve the usability. That's one of my, my uh, key points. What is the usability at the classroom level, not the one-to-one -one usability? What is the usability of a technology if you consider the classroom ecosystem? Then, in this case, we don't have to improve teacher training. Well, then it's Do we have time for one more? Uh, okay, let's, let's do one more. Hi, uh, my name is Ginny, and I have a question about, have you begun to imagine, um, although you're busy skiing and things, have you begun to imagine orchestration in, in online courses? How can, how can this concept of, of teacher intercession, uh, instructor intercession, uh, intercession um, be designed into the design of online courses possibly? Um, because I can't see the teacher fall down or change or bang on the desk in, a, in an online context. I think if you take the forums as they are used in Coursera and in edX, they are not bad from the orchestration point of view. You know, there are a lot of features that allow the teacher to kind of uh, manage. And uh, otherwise, my answer is no. I mean, I, I would like, for instance, uh, that basically in a MOOC you have a script which is very rigid and it's difficult to change anything. And in the, the, the kind of things that I presented, a graph is more like an organic stuff where you can move, if there is some elasticity, things can be moved easily, some things should not be moved. So I would like to have a MOOC platform that allows this flexibility. It is, as far as I know, it is not the case currently. In the future learn platform, they have introduced a notion of orchestration. I don't know exactly where it is in the technology. I have not seen completely what it, what it is. George, your turn. Okay, well, uh, Pierre, thank you very much uh, for uh, an outstanding keynote and an engaging uh, set of questions from the audience. Thank you for that as well. Uh, Pierre, uh, he was at the Learning, uh, Learning Sciences Conference last week, so unfortunately he actually has to go back home and ski and drink wine. So uh, he won't be here for the balance of the event, so just so you're aware, but Pierre, thank you for joining us.